Good evening, and welcome to the PNG Alumni Stepping Up During the COVID-19 Crisis Webinar. I'm Stuart Schaefer, the chair of the PNG Alumni Cincinnati Chapter, and your host for this webinar. I'm glad to see so many alumni members from the Cincinnati and New York City chapters online and many other friends and colleagues. The board of the Cincinnati chapter put this webinar together three weeks after we asked alums for stories of PNG alums doing heroic things that we could share and celebrate broadly. We had many more amazing stories than we could use in one webinar, and I hope we get to do this again soon. Today, I think you'll be inspired by the stories you're about to hear. We want to hear from you, and when you leave the webinar, a window will pop up in your browser with a short survey. Please give us 60 seconds of your time for feedback. Now, Pete Blackshaw, CEO of Centrifuge, and our moderator for this evening will lead the discussion with our panel. Pete, the meeting is yours. I certainly hope many of you in the audience not only raise your hand and say, how can I help? How can I contribute? But we hope some of you jump into our innovation economy and say, this is going to be my next chapter in my life to kind of figure out these critical uh, societal um, and health challenges out there. So. Without further ado, I'll, I'll say a few words about what I do at the end of the quick introductions, but I wanted to ask each of the panelists to um, talk a little bit about their background and their passion for the topic, and then we'll talk about what they've specifically been doing in this area. So why don't we start with uh, Doug, uh, you know, Doug Hall, who many of you know, you know, founder of Eureka Ranch, now CEO of Brain Brew Custom Whiskey, um, I'll let him talk about it, but it's absolutely amazing. Doug. Yeah, so, so I've been an innovator forever at Proctor. I did 10 years, led, led the adventure team. And, um, and so the Eureka Ranch and, and the blessing that we had is I, I created this crazy whiskey company. It was a hobby that got out of control to the point where now we're doing a lot. And so, uh, you know, this thing came around and well, you just got to do it. So you just do it. I have a daughter who's a CDC epidemiologist. And in January, she was telling me the world was going to come to an end. And in February, she was screaming at me. So early March, I'm like, okay, okay, we'll start. And so next thing you know, we're on track to 2 million ounces. I don't know how that happened. Unbelievable. Um, okay, we're going to come back. We're going to double click on that in a moment. Um, Andy Gudgeon, you're uh, with uh, Apex, doing amazing stuff on this front. Tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your company. Hi, yes, I'm Andy Gudgeon with Apex 360. I was with P&G for many years in product supply and film care and in beauty care. I'm an entrepreneur. I started Apex and um, I just have a passion for helping and uh, came across this amazing opportunity to help um, provide fiber shields. Um, and these are face shields for first responders and uh, medical workers. So I'm um, just, uh, thanks for uh, having me, Stuart, and I'm honored to be here with uh, John and Doug and Pete, and uh, I'm just happy to be here, and I hope that we can inspire someone today. Excellent. All right, we're going to come right back to you in a moment. Uh, John Melander from Venti Now, also doing some fantastic work in a slightly different, uh, yet equally important space. Um, John. Okay, so, uh, yeah, my story is, is similar to, to Doug's in that... Uh, I have a sister, one of my many sisters, but one of my sisters out in um, San Francisco is an ER doc out on the front lines. And back in March, she was telling us that uh, uh, this huge crisis that they're going to have with the shortage of ventilators in the US and also around the globe. And uh, said, uh, she knew I was an engineer. So she said, John, what could you do? And it's the famous question that all of us ask ourselves, you know, if not me, then who? If not now, then when? And so uh, we launched right into that head, head, uh, head first. And in three weeks, we were in the uh, labs at University of Cincinnati Medical Center testing our unit. And five weeks later, or a total of five weeks, we actually had our FDA authorization to go forward and uh, bring these to hospitals. So uh, uh, just been a, been a crazy ride going through here. Fantastic. Okay, and it's a quick, um, you know, quick background on me. Um, uh, been in, heading up Centrifuge for about a year and a half, and we're trying to build, uh, turn Cincinnati in one of the top uh, tech economies in the country. Uh, my KPI is to make us a number one startup hub in the Midwest. And so I'm thinking a lot about uh, not only saving startups that are currently out there, but also how do we 
treat this unique moment as an opportunity to leverage um, you know, more entrepreneurs to solve these big issues. I, I, I believe Cincinnati can make a bigger mark, a big mark in this area. One um, modest contribution that we have made in partnership with a couple startups in the last couple months, um, Centrifuge, uh, actually John Seger, who's the, uh, our head of innovation um, and a P&G alum, partnered with uh, InfoTrust and Polar 3D. And in Union Hall, where we have our home base and OTR, we have over 100 3D printers that are producing um, protective masks. I think we've produced maybe about 15,000 so far. And uh, even though the workers and the co-workers aren't there, Union Hall is working 24 seven. And we've learned a lot about open source 3D designs. Um, you know, we've been able to serve quite a few players that are out there, everything from Free Store Food Bank to Mercy Health Children's, Ronald McDonald House, you name it. I think we've all been surprised uh, at just the sheer need that is out there. But um, what I love about the experience is it gave us an excuse to walk the talk. And I feel like I'm giving speeches all the time about speed and agility. And we were able to set this up in 48 hours. And I think that's the spirit that all of us are experiencing. And so let's go back to Doug and let's double click a little bit on your process, your learning. Um, I mean, you live and breathe this, but this is different than what you've been doing in the past. What else should we know about your particular method on the hand sanitizer process? Well, I mean, we had a blessing in that our parent company, the Eureka Ranch, we teach people how to fail fast, fail cheap. We have a whole field of study that we license out to companies through partners. And, and so, you know, everybody has to get training before they do it. And we're used to it. I mean, we made, when we're making our whiskey, it's not uncommon for us to do 72 whiskeys in seven days. And so we've got a speed team. And so they flipped. But what, what the, the two things that were really tough things that happened early on was first off, we were Ill, illegal, legal, then illegal, then legal again. I mean, it's been a nightmare. And part of what happened to us was we then had to decide what we were going to do. And the challenge, two challenges we faced, one is when I learned that the equipment you're going to use to bottle hand sanitizer, whether it's the stuff we're making or the stuff that's being donated to us to package, mm -hmm. will never be used for anything else again. Right. So it's like that pump, that tank, the denaturant so bad, you've got to be willing to sacrifice it. And the guys took an old filler head that was broken and they fixed it. Um, and, and so that was a nightmare. And then the second thing was we had to make a decision early on how were, what were we going to do? Were we going to charge people or not? And of course, we're a craft distillery. There's a spirit of craft selling seemed wrong to me and everybody else. So I said, okay, well, I'll put up this amount of money. We'll buy the packaging and we'll do it. And when it's gone, it's gone. It was like 8,000 liters or something like that, or 10,000 liters we we're going to do. And, and I said, and if people donate, they can, but we're just going to give it. And, you know, we got to around 200 organizations we'd given it to. And we're sitting there going, what do we do next? And it was going to be like a huge investment in bottles and caps and cartons and blah, blah, blah. And uh, somebody said, well, I wonder how much has been donated. Because we had this online you know, count going on and nobody really looked at it because we didn't know if people were going to do it. And uh, sure enough, there was like a ton of money that had been put in. And just enough to make the next purchase or to cover half of it. And I said, well, if we've got half now, then we'll get the rest. And people have been generous beyond belief in what they've donated, their time, ranch clients, even at Gojo that make Purell helped us with FDA approval. I mean, P&G alums that I met in, in uh, Madrid at, when I spoke at the conference last fall. I mean, she connects me, Anna connects me to her company to get bottles that you can't buy. You can't buy them. <laughs> can't buy them. And it's been those connections of people and the kindness of people that have taken us from, oh, we'll do a few, to next thing you know, we're full out, two shifts a day, bottling ridiculous volumes of hand sanitizer um, because you've been pulled forward by just the support. And as she said, the stories from people are just, you know, what the it's hell a happened? You know, why doesn't the hospitals and nursing homes have anything? It doesn't make any sense. Right. It's a good theme. In fact, I want to come back to this a little bit later about the power of network effects. And, you know, because one could argue that 
the PNG Alumni Association in particular is probably more powerful than ever right now because people yeah. really respond to need. There's a fluidity that you're describing there, um, Doug, that I think is going to play out with the other presentations. But I want to come back to network effects in a bit. But Andy, uh, yeah. tell me about your experience. What resonates based on what you heard from Doug? Well, uh, a lot of similarities um, from what, uh, what uh, I've heard from Doug. Um, the biggest, I think, is the where the heck is the equipment? Where, it, where in the world is the protection that folks so desperately need? You know, my journey with this started from a phone call that said, hey, can you help to produce some of these fiber shields? Now, my company produces very small quantities because we work upstream. So a partner company, Zumbiel Packaging, I reached out to them to say, hey, can you help me get involved here? Or, or do you guys want to play a role? And uh, they had already converted a piece of cutting equipment over to cut acrylic pieces out versus the fiberboard that they were used to using. So uh, I jumped, you know, on uh, with them to help start distributing these and the need was just unbelievable. When I was reaching out to uh, fire departments, just individuals, first responders, hospitals, it was no holds barred as far as what could be shipped in there. You know, I'm used to an FDA protocol and well, we have to only accept materials that are on the approved materials list and these types of things. All that has gone out the window. Hospitals wow. are taking what they can get, um, just like you know what John and Doug had mentioned about having extra help with approvals and FDA and things. There is a huge need out there. Um, I think that just from a humanitarian standpoint, we all want to do something. I was fortunate enough to make some phone calls and find a place to help, but you know, the need is still there. We're still, you know, distributing these and churning them out. And I don't know when the end's in sight, but I think if we all kind of look around at our networks and what we can contribute and try to do something in that kind of PNG spirit where many, many of us came from, we can do a lot. And we've done a lot in a very short amount of time. Yeah, and just to put some dimension on that, we were talking earlier, uh, to be precise, 216,000 masks. I mean, it's a matter of weeks with a couple hundred thousand more. I think you shipped already some of them uh, overseas. Or, um, but the, uh, that, that's really, really impressive. Um, just out of curiosity, um, would you do it again if you knew it would go on for years? I mean. Absolutely. I mean, we're still looking to do more. So, you know, we want to continue to look around, identify the needs. You know, of course, we're also, you know, an essential business. So we're, you know, keeping the employees happy and the clients happy while we're also trying to stretch and expend, you know, extend even further on how we can help. Um, I think that we're all in the same boat as far as wanting to, you know, continue Fantastic. to help in any way. Yeah. Hey, Pete. Yeah. Um, I'll just tell you, you know, I just want to go back to making this uh, <laughs> that tastes good and stop making this. Somebody said, are you looking forward to continuing this? So this will be a business. I said, hell no. This is the worst tasting crap we've ever made. I want to make this. Well, we do. <laughs> we appreciate your pivot. And, uh, and I think, I think um, in fact, you had just gotten a bunch of awards. I think seven yeah. awards, uh, <laughs> and you and you parked it. So I'm even more impressed. I love. Yeah, the, uh, but we we all know that Doug is a softy, so he'll keep making the hand sanitizer. I've already two thousand bottles today. For crying out loud! Oh, that's. I love it. Okay, John. So you're um, you know, you're kind of more in the ventilator space, and that's obviously getting a ton of publicity. Um you know, mostly on uh, not enough, um, but you're kind of looking at a kind of an interesting way of, uh, of, 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 uh, of producing them. Uh, tell us your story. Okay, so for, for our, our story, you know, it, it started off first with, um, there's gotta be somebody out there who's looked at this before. And, and, and that's one of the things I learned at PNG and the connect and develop role I had was that 
uh, there's somebody who has solved this problem. And as I looked through the medical literature, I found out that uh, in Britain, they had actually paid uh, the medical university in Wales at Swansea to go and develop a rapid, um, a, a ventilator system that could be rapidly produced in case the world ever faced a pandemic. You know, pretty prescient, right? That, that somebody actually looked at that in advance. So that was done about 2008. I pulled out that literature done out of the medical school, looked at what they had was an elegantly simple design, and then took that and then modified that design to go and deliver the benefits that are needed uh, uh, that the pulmonologists and the respiratory therapists were telling us really needed to be in place. And then from that, three weeks later, we're in UC's med lab actually actually running the unit on, uh, on their instrumented mannequins uh, in the test labs. And in five weeks, we've got the uh, EUA, uh, or excuse me, that's an emergency use authorization. And the, the crazy story I was telling you before was uh, over the Easter weekend, I'm communicating with the FDA guy over the email um, all, through, all through the weekend. So they were burning the oil through the weekend, helping support us. So I actually have a really good story on the FDA side. Um, now, would you have ever imagined like a year ago that products could go to market that fast? Oh, not, not in the least. If you had asked me, you know, what was my plans for this summer? It was working <laughs> on my handicap in golf, right? So, so this, is, this is now looking at, um, you know, what can we do that can make a difference in the world? And in so many places around the globe, um, the, you know, the U.S. is in the midst of it right now. Africa has not quite gotten to it. South America is on the rise right now. So we, we see just an enormous demand to provide, um, you know, way, uh, the respiratory help that they need to be able to keep these people alive and hopefully keep them off of being intubated. And what else are you seeing among peers that are trying to solve similar issues? Are you networked into all the innovations going on? in this area? Um, it's interesting, there, there's, we've been trading a lot of stuff back and forth. Um, actually, once we got our, our FDA authorization, I got a ton of emails and we went back and forth with a number of different um, uh, players who are out there who are looking to solve problems. And we've been able to share some of the solutions that we've been able to put in place. Um, so it, yeah, it's, it's a very entrepreneurial, very, very, uh, it's a collaborative effort. And I think people view it as, um, you know, the world's in this together. So uh, converse, uh, there's a guy in Switzerland that I've been conversing back and forth with who's trying to build similar systems um, uh, in Northern Italy. You know, it, just a, another example of, of um, we're all in this together because this virus doesn't take favorites. Yeah. Well, I want to I wanna talk about, and I, John, I want you to make the first comment, but I want to talk about this power of volunteerism because mm -hmm. There is, it's, it's not just the ideas, it's not the technology, it's not the testing, it's like this convergence of passionate volunteers swarming around these opportunities. And you managed to get, I think, 30, um, you know, volunteers to uh, commit themselves to this project, half of them PNG alums, I'm told. Um, yep. How did you do that? Well, yeah, it's, it's amazing how the network works. So believe it or not, one of my first phone calls was to a consulting company that I've worked with called Your Encore that uh, hires a lot of uh, P&G retirees and uses them uh, because I knew nothing about how to get something through the FDA. And they have a whole cadre of experts um, in the FDA. And immediately three of them stepped up and said, yes, we'll volunteer. And they were the ones who helped us frame our FDA submission, be able to get this into the system and get it through quickly. Um, and, and it's a skill base I don't have. It's one I can't claim I've ever been part of. Uh, the Always product was the only regulated product I had ever worked on. But, but trying to go and understand that, and then I was able to bring in supply chain experts, uh, folks out of design and engineering, um, who, who I know through my network that I've been able to pull into this. Um, lots of family members. So uh, I'll give a, a shout out to them. I have seven sisters and a brother. And uh, so a baseball team for us Molanders. And uh, they represent attorneys, doctors, uh, um, um, geneticists, uh, uh, architects, everything under the sun, but, but lots of skill bases, business uh, 
uh, skill bases I was able to bring in also from family. Uh, if you look at our website for ventinow.org, uh, my daughter built a website. So, uh, you know, it's, it's really pulling in all of this. But what's really cool is, is all the people that, that flow to you who want to help. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, just this week, we got another volunteer coming on in who's helping us. Uh, the University of Cincinnati, uh, there's a pre professor in their biomedical engineering school. He's brought three students in. So I have three interns that are working for us, um, helping us with uh, our project. Now, uh, John, I do have a, a I do want to go to the other two, but I just got a yeah. quick question. Showed yeah. up on the Q&A list, but one is from Paul Amiat, who's an alum and an emergency room doctor, who wants to know, do you have results with patients yet, and how does your device compare with current ventilators? Uh, th the answer is, I don't have results on patients. Um, you know, we're doing with, work with UC, with porcine and other stuff, but um, uh, we're anxious to get these on out to, to hospitals. Um, our first production run is underway in Indiana at a class two medical supply. So uh, come the end of the month, I'll have my first batch of machines coming out to be able to go and see that. But we have tested them side by side with other ventilator systems. So I would tell Paul, if, if he wants to contact me, I would love to go and have the conversation and share what we're seeing. And we're right. also, because we're getting data from the front lines, we're also learning that um, what we knew about ventilation a year ago doesn't really apply to these COVID-19 patients, the ARDS patients. And, they're taking, they're, there's a need that they have that is slightly different than the way a, a typical ventilator would work. So we've been adapting our process to tailor it to that need. Okay, great. Um, now you talked about distribution. Doug, can you say a little bit about distribution challenges? We were talking a bit about supply chain. Um, what's yeah. going on there? So, you know, making this stuff, you know, it's just, it's really just very high alcohol. You just distill it real high and then you add a bunch of stuff that makes it taste terrible. Mm -hmm. um, it's really not that big of a deal once you sacrifice the equipment for it um, because your equipment won't be used again, as I said. But the problem has been probably a third of my day today, even now, and it was 100% of my day, was spent on supply chain and distribution. You know, uh, I, I, we, we, as we teach at the ranch, we joke that, okay, yeah, the, it's cute, but if you can't get the raw materials to make it, and you can't get it through regulatory, and then you can't distribute it, and the customer doesn't want it, um, you know, you can't make it work. And this, the systems have all fallen apart, because all of the packaging materials, all of the labels, every, all of the yeah. components, prices have gone, I, you let the best of people and the worst. And I've got some people that used to yeah. be vendors of ours who will never, ever be a vendor of mine again. I will never buy anything from them. Um, and I've got others that are now my new new ones because of their kindness. But the distribution supply chain, especially when numbers are going exponential on what we were making, um, you know, you're like ordering and then you're like ordering again. And now next thing you know, you got tractor trailers coming to deliver the stuff. And then on the distribution side, there were some, we're supplying now in partnership with Proctor, um, we're, we're bottling all the stuff for United Way and for all the hospitals and through the chamber, we're giving out kits. In fact, if you're in Cincinnati, contact the chamber. They've got wonderful kits that we're putting together. But getting them out has been epically challenging. And thank goodness that I've got a bunch of young people that are awesome with the internet because they blasted it out. And we've got over 500 organizations so far. Um, and that's going to go up into the thousands now. But how, by the way, how is how, supply and distribution? The it, you think that's it? That's like, not, I mean, what John's doing is so epic. It is so epic. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and then to take it to international is awesome. And, and redeploying, I mean, these things are, um, but we don't understand. We don't give confidence. We think it's the idea. It's not. It's the system from front to back that is the difference between success and failure. And Doug, how did you uh, talk PNG into donating chemicals from the, the Lima, Ohio plant? Was that easy? Uh, well, what happened is they had a problem. They, got, uh, they had 55 gallon drums and you can't do much and it's also a fire hazard. Um, and you have to have an explosion proof building with explosion proof lighting and which is what we've got with our new distillery. And I have a bottling line that was supposed to come in from Italy not going to be here anytime soon <laughs> um, and uh, so we had the space and and so we did it and they've been um, awesome to work for 
um, I say work for because we really are, you know, we're doing following their practice. But what's been most amazing is in the beginning, there were a lot of rules. And literally, I mean, 1130 last night, I was texting with the company and we were adapting the policies. And yeah. so they've been walking the talk way more than they did when I was there a long time ago. Yeah, it was, I was really incredibly crazy. impressive, the flexibility of adapting to, you know, changes that sometimes were like epically stupid and they go, that's really dumb. It's done. I'll make that go away. Yeah, I've got a couple of Proctor uh, executives on my, my board, uh, Valerie Shepard and Steve Bishop, and I sent a note about what we were doing at Union Hall and God, I was just so flattered and impressed to how quickly Steve responded and just said, you know, and he kind of immediately hooked us up with some of his folks and they were willing to chip in. I'm not sure whether we used the connection or not, but it was just, there was an agility and there was a nimbleness. There was a, there was kind of a, a volunteer passion there that I, you know, there was some of that when I was at Proctor, but this, it, but I do feel like all the big companies are kind of in a different place and uh, it's really, it's, it, it opens up a lot of possibilities. Well, here, just so, a, one real quick, one real quick thing, because I think alumni will appreciate this because it did to me, at least. There were a lot of issues in the beginning that P&G wanted their product versus ours donated to nonprofits, medical, you know, there were all these policies appropriately. And then I started talking to them and I said, okay, so a nursing home that's a for-profit company, but that's high risk people, so you don't want to give to them? I'll take care of that. I'll use mine for that. And we went through a couple of these and they realized the foolishness and he came out and he looked up at me and he said, Doug, you know what we're supposed to do. I go, what's that? He says, just do the right thing. Do the right thing. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. I laid out, I said, here's my principles for who we donate to and why. Here's how we do it. Here's how we check for fraud. Because there's also been Amazon resellers gaming us and the worst of the worst. Yeah, and, and yeah. I was just like going, damn, that's the proctor. That uh, yeah, I know you're eager to jump time. in on some of these comments. Uh, I'll <laughs> kind of give you the floor because there's a lot of well, things that have been said. I'm sure you've got some builds on. Mm -hmm. Well, I, yeah. I'd like to. Well, go ahead. Well, I was gonna for for me, I think that um, kind of the biggest eye opening is the fact that people are putting kind of their own their own needs or their own processes and uh, typical ways of uh, responding or SOPs aside and doing the right thing. You know, jumping to help someone, like you guys have shown examples of, um, for goodness sakes, the FDA, you know, giving you special clearance and, and the green light to move forward. Um, I think that that just says something for the agility of everyone involved, that we are trying to all do the right thing for folks. And uh, I just think that that says something about the spirit of, you know, P&G alumni and all of us getting together to try to help and do what makes sense for people. And then how many people have you called, you know, that have been looking for, you know, masks and, I mean, have you been doing a lot of outreach or? Oh. When I started, when I started making phone calls, I thought, is this even a need of a really good friend of mine as a firefighter in Covington? And I called her and I said, Hey, I have these things. And I showed a picture and I said, is this really a need? Is this something that you guys, and she said, Oh my gosh, Andy, yes, we need them. So the more phone calls that I made and just actually reaching out, introducing myself, um, first and foremost, letting people know that these were no charge. The need and the desperation in their voices just made me tear up. I mean, in this country that we are so blessed and we have so much, the fact that I'm talking to friends and colleagues and people in healthcare and people at nursing homes and at fire stations and the desperation in their voices and their gratefulness for us to be able to provide something that they so desperately need, it was really a tearjerker and really yeah. opened my eyes that these are scary times and to be able to help in a very tiny, tiny way 
felt great, but it's also a very vulnerable feeling that how, how is this happening? Um, how are the folks that are protecting us not being given the things that they need so desperately? Uh, it's just hard to understand. Um, no. I want to add both. Hey, Pete, can I build on something that uh, yeah, please. Doug was talking about? Mm -hmm. Please, please. So, so uh, Doug, you talked about Procter & Gamble. I, I wanted just to go and build on that for a minute um, mm -hmm. because that's really how we got out of the chute and off to such a, a fast start. I, I, I had put together you know, my thought process for this and um, uh, I approached Kathy Fish, who is the Chief Technology Officer for P&G. And I know Kathy from previous work that we had done. Uh, I'd worked for her when she was in baby care and told her of the concept of what we were trying to do to be able to support this. And in a very short period of time, I had some seed money to get started on the path, you know, to be able to go and kick this off. And they've been very gracious about flowing skills to me. So uh, I use not only alumni, but I've also used a few current employees and they've been gracious enough to free up their time um, in our design and development efforts. So they, they've been a fabulous supporter. And, and frankly, I couldn't be where I am right now in this project without their support. So uh, incredibly grateful. And it really is living the PVPs and, and the whole you know, force of good you know, that, that is out there for the company right now. I, I, I think they absolutely they walk the talk on that. I just I just have to echo a comment I saw on the chat board from Ann Mooney that this is so inspiring. It is really inspiring. And I think we are kind of in a bit of an entrepreneurial renaissance. I mean, it's obviously everything we learned in our PNG days was very, very important, but mm -hmm. a lot of it is also being scrambled and accelerated and barriers are breaking down. And one of the questions I wanted to ask you is you think about beyond this wonderful endeavor that you're pursuing are you thinking differently about business process andy as you go back into the mainstay of your business is there something that you've learned from this remarkable accelerated nimble exercise that's going to change the way you think about business and i'm curious to hear what doug says as well because he's been podcasting and writing about the perfect method but i want to know whether he's been humbled by what he's learned but andy why don't you jump in first you know, I think that, um, you know, as business leaders, you're faced with challenges that you never expected. Um, that could be, you know, handling different employee situations or handling, you know, different clients or whatever it can be. Um, this is brand new. So this is not only just a brand new way of life for all of us day to day and our families and friends, but also for how we conduct and handle business. So it was, it was major learning for me in the position that I was taking with the company was of course the leadership role and where's the company headed and, and how can we improve in, in every way and you know keep uh, making our clients happy. Then all of a sudden the pivot was, wait a minute, now I'm responsible for the safety of the employees as well as you know, out, you know, outside people coming in. So for me, I think that it's just opened my eyes to a whole new world of safety, what's really important to employees and the clients, and how pivotal we can all be when it comes to a time of crisis like this. Um, there's a lot of terrible stories out there. You know, Doug had mentioned about you know, people price gouging or trying to sell things on Amazon. But the silver lining is there is that there's a whole lot of good that's coming out yeah. as well. And there's a whole lot of family memories and family time and togetherness and how we all kind of reached out and embraced each other, not only now, but for whatever might be coming in the future, you know, the next six months or a year. Um, you know, John talked a little bit the other day to us about, you know, future um, you know, what can be coming and where are we in this pandemic? So um, I think it's brought an additional sense of humility to all of us, it, whether it's in business or at home. Great comment. So Doug, Doug Hall, are you going to approach your highly scientific business differently now that you've done what you've done with the hand sanitizer? 
Well, I, I think probably the biggest thing for me is, um, and it's a thing that comes out, um, it's, of course, it's Court of Proctor and the DNA of many of us, um, and I've tried to put it into my organization, is it's all about culture and the mindset of the people. And, you know, when we, when we did this, um, we, we made it, I said, announced, and they're all owners, so we're in it together. And I said, okay, we're going to go for this. We're going to do this amount and we're done. And then all of a sudden we looked up and the demand was, as everybody says, it's beyond, literally within 10 minutes, the first 100 cases were gone and people just rode immediately. It was nuts. I said, okay, we're going to go bigger, and, but we're not going to make money on it. We're just going to cover our costs. And fortunately, the values of the team, there were a couple of people that are new who haven't been there as long. We're like, why are we doing this? Is this really what we should be doing? And the team just so came behind and just took it over that all of that soft stuff you do to build your team and to train them and to teach them, this shit matters, man. It really does when you're in this situation. When you're just doing PowerPoint decks, nothing freaking matters. <laughs> yeah. But when you got to do something, the culture is the difference that has made it work. And my, you know, you always see a Drucker you know, you know, culture eat strategy for lunch or whatever it was that he said. It, it's right. It's right. Yeah, great, 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 great point. Um, by the way, Stuart, you wanted to... Um... One more thing I want to say oh, yeah, please. about this topic is that I was in my little silo. You know, I was felt desperate and I was looking for a place to help. I wanted to help somehow. I didn't know how to help. I started making phone calls under, um, you know, and uncovered this amazing opportunity to do a little something. So I'm, you know, right here. Well, I have no idea that Doug is doing his amazing work and John is doing his amazing work and, and Pete, you're, you know, you have amazing things going on. So I just appreciate this um, platform to be able to learn and share as well what each other is doing and whoever else out there is is working on amazing things too it's been fantastic outstanding outstanding now Stuart, i think you wanted to show john's product you want to hop on real quick absolutely actually i'd like to i'd like to make play a little game uh let's <laughs> see i'm gonna i'm gonna show john's product first because john i mean someday if anything ever happens to you they're gonna say what do you remember about john john and i worked at png together um, and John's a great guy, but you know, if they ever asked me to give a talk about John, this is the John I'm going to remember, which is, Aww. you know, what a guy. It's a long ways from Sherman. Um, <laughs> Amen. So, little, little practice there. Oh, so I just want you guys to see just how wild and crazy uh, <laughs> what folks are working on. And, and Doug, you know, you've got a story about your team. Um, and I'm going to put your I'm going to put your picture up there about the psychology of your team, um, and particularly motivating you know some of the younger folks. So I don't know you shared parts of it, but if you want to take over, because this picture I think captures uh, what you were talking about. Yeah, yeah, we trashed the ranch, by the way. You know they're working at home. When they come back, we're in big trouble when they come back. Um, but you can see the team of folks, and they're across ages, but a lot of young folks. And there isn't a single person. I mean, here we make. Life star, highest rated bourbon in the world. Not a single, in fact, folks around the country, if you're watching this, it's called Noble Oaks, available around the world. You can get that, that's ours. Um, but there isn't a single person there that knows how to make whiskey. I hired chefs because chefs get systems and they get taste and they get customer service. Yeah. Uh, not yeah. celebrity chefs, I'm talking about real ones that actually you know, <laughs> run places. And, and they're epic. Their ability to pivot and to move is just, um, I mean, I'm in awe. Uh, I'm in yeah. awe of these people. <laughs> it's funny. It's I've I've always thought that uh, when I think about uh, OTR, I always think about it as like an innovation trifecta of design, tech, and food. And the food entrepreneurs are, I think, some of the most inspiring catalysts of innovation. And I almost feel like all of us on the tech side should be sitting in the kitchen and watching them innovate. And so. We need to think about how we create these collisions between these uh, different, uh, you know, kind of uh, focus areas. What, what, one of the funniest parts of this was when they said they, you know, we're printing labels and 
we're just doing labels. And he says, well, the safeguard wants to put their label on it. And I said, safeguard? No shit. He says, yeah. I go, you know, that was my first brand manager. I was a brand manager safeguard. I said, well, we just bring some labels. He said, ah, forget it. When the next run comes up, add it in. I mean, it was, it was so perfectly do the right thing, you know. And so we got label, you know, the safeguard name on them eventually. But I said, you know, I can't take my liquid and yours because, you know, this guy, I don't need two labels. So it may be the only label in the world where it says manufactured by Procter & Gamble and or Brain Brew. <laughs> <laughs> and or. Because <laughs> some's mine, some's theirs, whatever. <laughs> well, uh, Stuart, we've got some questions. Should we knock off oh. some of these? Well, I want to give Andy a, she's got a picture too, oh, you know. Oh yeah, please. Oh yeah, let's see what we got. All right. So Andy, uh, let's see. Um, I want you to tell us who who is who is this person? Okay, so those are some of the gentlemen who are with the Covington uh, Fire Department. And they are modeling some of the uh, fiber shields that they were donated. Oh. Uh, I believe that their shipment arrived via pickup truck. <laughs> so uh, a good friend of mine works for that department and she, uh, she had a couple of the gentlemen there uh, sport the masks. And I received so many letters and emails and, and uh, you know, just gratitude. And so I got quite a few pictures of people with the masks on from all over the country. And uh, yeah, there, that's a letter from a uh, Taylor Mill Fire Department. And uh, you know, these are the things that I really wasn't expecting. <laughs> you know, it's like these, these folks are out doing their job on the front lines every day. And then I have, you know, um, a healthcare workers sending pictures with their shields. And I have this amazing letter and a really nice face Facebook post from the chief in Taylor Mill and I've received that picture from the Covington that's a girl named Danielle she's in a medical facility in Alabama um, and uh, you know it was it was sweet that they took a moment out of their busy day to uh, send a little note and to uh, you know thank us for the masks uh, thank us for the shields I, it just I didn't even expect it so and, and Andy, we've got New York Fantastic. folks. Fantastic. I love yeah. that. Thank you. Yeah. It's good stuff. It really is. We have New York uh, so chapter on the, on the call, too. Is there anything you want to tell the folks in New York about your project? Didn't they get, receive a few masks or a few face shields oh, from New yeah. York? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sir. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Uh, around 100,000 masks went to the state of New York um, so far. So, uh, yeah, we were able to help you know, not only some of the tri-state area out, but also, you know, we've been extending our reach. Um, so, you know, one thing that, um, you know, that we, I, I believe we might get to is, you know, what we need your help at. And, um, and, and that's one of the things that I need the help from uh, all the great folks out there who are attending today, is if you have a need, if you know of a need for these fiber shields, um, the, they, uh, the, the website is fibershield.org, and uh, I believe Stuart will be sharing my contact information personally. So if you know someone out there that has a need, uh, please reach out to me, and I will do everything that I can to make sure that their needs are met. Fantastic. All right. And then, Stuart, I don't know, do you have a, uh, the picture I just flipped your way? I do. Just to give you a kind of a feel for, I uh, hope I don't. That's awesome. I don't know if John's on the line, but this is from Union Hall, and you can see the uh, there's about 100 3D machines. Those are the kind of empty spools, and I wanted to give a shout out because uh, we actually uh, there's actually been quite a few folks in different neighborhoods who chipped in on certain aspects of the production. This is John Steiger's kids who uh, <laughs> came in for Saturday selflessly to kind of help out, um, but there's been probably. Uh, a handful of families uh, that have literally kind of chipped into different parts of the assembly line. And it just speaks to the, uh, this incredible community passion to solve problems really fast. And, um, and uh, you know, we need more of this. Yeah, great. Now let's get some of these uh, questions here. We got quite a few. Let me, uh, let me pick one here. Um, let's see, uh, where do we want to start? Let me take a look here. 
Oh, here's a good one from Maria uh, Freitas. He says, do you think that better and faster procedures with our regulatory bodies for putting products out are here to stay? Who wants to answer that one? Well, let me, let me say, just say something real quick on it. Um, I've been impressed that somewhere, you know, I keep telling people just be human during this, that there's a human because they gave permission for distilleries to do hand sanitizer under the WHO recipe that doesn't have denaturin in it. So the stuff that makes you throw up that you can't drink it. And then they changed the policy and said you had to put it in. Um, and so we produced and then we had to stop and then we had to figure that out and then we got that figured out. And that was one of those where they were right to give us the permission but they were also right to claw it back because literally poisoning went up when people started to do some of this stuff. And there was some cases of it from the TTV of it coming in. And so, and a lot of us were using whiskey bottles and that, cause that's what we had. And, and so they were open, but there was a line where they said no. And the same thing happened in Canada with our partner up in Canada. And it was the right decision. Um, and so I, I just, you know, it wasn't just do anything you want. There was some voice of reason. Yeah. And I and I, I respect that. I thought it was pretty pretty impressive. Hey, Pete, I would I would echo that too. And my experience with the FDA, I, I was very impressed with just how knowledgeable they were in the, the world of respiration and and how carefully they went through it. The questions they came back to me with were all spot on. Um, so I, I, I came away from this feeling like okay, if you get something approved through the FDA, it, it's really been, they've taken a hard look at it, but th they were real clear up front with me that this is a temporary authorization and, and that I would need to have full FDA compliance, full FDA clearance um, to be able to continue after the, the emergency gotcha. use period. Now, John, I have a follow-up for you from Robert Vinnie, and this is a, a long question, but a good one. So, Seems like we need a rapid testing capability that's cheap enough to be given to employees, teachers, school staff, and administrators every week so that consumers have confidence in their safety to shop. Um, you know, employees have confidence uh, that they can work safely and parents have the confidence in the safety of their kids in school in August. Otherwise, we have the choices of either a very slow ramp up of the economy in schools or to accept an increase in the infection and death rates. Could we use John's approach in that area. What do you say, John? Yeah, I, I'm not sure if it really would apply to the testing piece, but what I'll tell you is uh, the New York Times had a really good article about um, uh, the different testing systems that are out there right now and, and the pretty broad, uh, uh, I, I have to tell you, there are like 14 different systems out there that are being used by different states and only really three or four of them passed, to, passed the muster on having accurate results. So there's a lot of work going on right now, I know through the CDC and other groups to be able to try and, and prove that. One of the things that we have to get beyond is this idea that it all has to be brewed by ourselves here in the US. Mm -hmm. Now South Korea has, been, has got a fabulous testing system that's available right now. The one in Germany is also quite effective. But, but what we did is we sat on our, on our hands on the, on the CDC system. And, and that really delayed what we need. Even today, many of the states have finally gotten approval to be able to go out and buy these from other countries. And I think that's kind of that, um, I, I take it back to that connect and develop type approach within Procter & Gamble. You know, what can you do to connect with other areas and, and bring in ideas, or in this case, bring in products that work for you? I, I don't think we can depend on the US making all the test kits that we need. We're going to have to buy these from other countries. And, and both South Korea and Europe both have got very effective ones um, uh, that could fill the need. And I think, I think to answer his question, I think uh, impressing upon your state government to reach out to uh, reach overseas to get those because uh, they are not coming up fast enough in the states. Uh, good, good and honest answer, thank you. Uh, another good one from Nick uh, Boshert, hope I pronounced that right. Um, really good one. P&G has always responded to short-term critical national needs going back to producing munitions at Ivorydale during World War II. Yep. Once this pandemic is over, which of the products P&G has started to produce do you think will continue on? Hand sanitizer seems like a good fit for home care, personal care, 
but do you think we'll continue with the masks and face shields? Do you think PPE will become a new ongoing category for PNG? Who wants to take that on? Andy, you want to start? Yeah, you know, I've I've been talking to a lot of the um, you know people who have the PPE needs, and there's definitely a need there. So I think that it's 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 what are we going to do for sourcing? Because in the past, so many uh, facilities have taken a just-in-time approach, and now that approach has caused some difficulties with receiving materials. And I think secondly, yet how are people going to be holding inventory or identifying what the needs are, you know? So there seems to be a swing with, before we wanted, you know, before we wanted like, you know, limited inventory to keep cash flow moving. And now we're taking another look at that, I think, um, specifically in the PPE realm. So um, I definitely think that there's some new opportunities there. And, you know, let's stretch. What else is there? You know, there's hand sanitizer. What, what other forms of sanitation needs mm -hmm. are there gonna be? You know, maybe, there are some new market categories opening for okay. the um, So I think there's gonna be a lot of changes and a lot of opportunity coming. What do you think, Doug? Uh, think about David Taylor's successor in a few years. Uh, will she talk about the PPE category in the same way she talks about, you know, diapers? I don't, I don't know. I, I, I'm, you know, I think that there's gonna be a reset and whether it's PPE or, uh, or we've changed the equipment that the antibacterial soaps become bigger. Hand sanitizer, as we know it, the category is going to have the most explosive growth the world has ever seen <laughs> this year. So I think it's going to be there. I think it may become, a lot of these things become components into many other things yeah. in a lot more places. Um, you know, that, that we're going to just see that and it's going to go into, you know, I've got clients that on the innovation side that are doing materials, high surface materials, and different things like that. We've got a partner in Kentucky that's doing some amazing things with masks, with antibacterial. I mean, I think we're going to see it less as a separate thing and more part of life. It's going to go into other products is where I think it's going to go. Yeah, uh, Pete, as we look at that, I think that um, we're going to find that, that the whole healthcare category is going to get a whole new reset, as Doug was saying. It'll be a whole new look at how do we care for the population. Um, and because our current system broke down. So, so, you know, it's time to rebuild it, try new things, you know, approach it in new ways, and businesses will become a very active part of it. You know, that they're, they're going to be the leaders um, and, and they're going to fill the void in many cases to help us um, as a country pull together and be able to go forward with this. Let me, let me just reinforce what Andy said. I mean, this is a real problem. Part of what the hospitals told me is I said, how did this happen? How do you have none for the ICU? And they said, we leaned it out. Right. We have no storage space. We got right. regular deliveries, you know, right. and all of, they did all the proper things, except there was no surge capacity in the system. And even now, I mean, we've got two loading docks. I've got a group I'm giving a lot of stuff to. And I, I, I said, I'd like to send you 10 pallets. And the lady said, and this is a big organization. She says, I'd love to take them. The most I can take is three. And, and I may have to go to two sometimes. I'm like, what the heck's going on here? You know, because we just don't have those spaces anymore. Right. Because we well, operated not looking at the whole, we operated on how can we get the cost low, not understanding the consequences for when you have this kind of situation. True. Well, we've hit some fantastic themes. I'm so grateful for the panelists. I think this speaks to the PNG spirit that we love so much as former employees. It speaks to the spirit of Cincinnati. And we know there is so, so, so much more work to be done. So for those that you are listening, even those in New York, you know, think about where you can volunteer. For those of you that have that entrepreneurial uh, itch, and I know most of you do, come join the Cincinnati Startup Economy and help solve these problems with purpose, with passion. There is a fantastic ecosystem 
that will support you because we believe in these solutions. And uh, Stuart, I'll let you have the last word, but thank you for pulling this together. The, 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 the chat stream was full of the word inspiration. So we need to do this again. Um, maybe we need to create a whole company out of this. I don't know. <laughs> Well, thank you, Pete and Andy and Doug. I mean, uh, online applause. You guys did fantastic uh, on short notice and what inspirational stories. Thanks for sharing them. Just for the audience, uh, you, as you click out, a screen, new screen will pop up in your browser with five questions. Uh, one of them is, would you like to see follow-ups to this? Uh, would you like to see, we've done, we're calling this session Rescue, and you can see why. Um, the next one we're thinking about doing is recovery, which is climbing out, and then after that, maybe renewal, which is what, is the, what does it look like a little longer term? But we want to know what you think of that, and please uh, put that in the survey. Um, then following the survey, in a few hours, you'll get an email with contact information for Andy, Doug, John, if you can help them with distribution uh, needs that they've got. Volunteers. I need volunteers. And volunteers. Um, I you, need you global can, connections. Global can, connections that we're trying to go for. <laughs> okay. And um, or you can, innovation platform for the alumni network. I bet it's like put out our need and our challenge. That's a big <laughs> absolutely. That's exactly what we need. <laughs> we need it. you all, everyone out there. We. <laughs> all right. Well, with all that, right. I can't top that. Thanks, everyone, and have a Thanks, great evening. Bye-bye.